Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Book Review. This is a series in which I'm reviewing mostly recent books in philosophy, particularly practical philosophy, extending all the way into things like leadership and personal development and self-help. But today we're going to be looking at one that's solidly within, you could call it, old school philosophy. It's On Truth by Simon Blackburn published with Oxford University Press back in 2018. And as usual, I'll be telling you about what I think is good about the book, what are the weak points or problematic aspects, giving you kind of an overview and summary. And I will say at the very beginning, and I'll say this again at the end, as well as we get to final thoughts, I find the book well written, but also, you know, kind of weak in certain respects. I think it could be a decent springboard for studies, but definitely just that. It's it's a starter book. It is not the definitive word on the topic. Yeah, so we'll, we'll find out why in just a minute. We always begin with looking at three S's, style, structure, and then a summary of what the work is about, because I think that is very helpful for people diving into this. So let's start with style. So Blackburn is a great writer. This is very readable. He's not um, dumbing things down in any way, but it's also quite approachable. And I think that's one of the strengths of the work and of Blackburn's writing in general, um, the structure, right? It's, it's divided basically into two parts. There's, after a, a brief preface and introduction, part one is the classic approaches. And what do we mean by the classic approaches? Well, now classic approaches towards the um, theories or, or, you know, perspectives on what truth itself is. And he's going to talk about um, five main ones, kind of unevenly, as, as we'll see in a moment. And there's a summary at the very end of it. And then part two is, is quite interesting, varieties of inquiry. And so he's going to talk about how truth plays out outside of, we could say, the realm of academic, abstract, theorizing about truth, and in other places ranging from art to religion to law and, and a variety of other things in between. There's um, a set of notes, you know, which are essentially just end notes. There's a useful index. And one of the things that's kind of interesting, he has a section back here called Further Investigations, which is giving you some idea of where you could go after this if you want to read more because this is a very slim volume you know uh, all the way back to the further investigations and the notes we've got 136 pages total so you know not not an awful lot here now um we should say something about the nature of the book itself right so these these two different parts uh, are going to be treating truth, but in different ways. And um, I will say this, if you're familiar with A.J. Ayer's language, truth, and logic, uh, a, you know, very early classic of analytic philosophy in the 20th century, this book is kind of like that. You know, it's beginning with some more general examinations and reflections and critiques, and then it's looking at specific issues and instances, some of the same ones, religion, ethics, you know, and we're going to talk about how uh, the deflationist theory, which um, Blackburn says that he has uh, some sympathy with, is, you know, kind of similar to some other things as well. So this is on page 63, and so this could be part of the summary. The reader may detect I have some considerable sympathies with deflationism, right? He he comes right out and says that. And so we're going to you know, look at what that is in just a moment. Um, he also tends to talk quite a lot about the need to get away from merely abstract theorizing and to 
carry out our thinking or theorizing in a way that's a bit different. And he says this. This is in, very deep in the book, in, in the last main chapter. The moral of these discussions is basically simple, but I hope sufficiently provocative to be worth ex emphasizing. Purse, James Bentham, and others constantly remind us of our actual activities and actual motivations and cares. We only have the language, the resources of thought that we do because some activities have proved useful or essential. These activities include trying to thrash things out, trying to warp our own heritage of beliefs and dispositions as little as possible in order to accommodate the problems that friction with the world throws up. The language of truth, reason, justification, knowledge, certainty, and doubt is our instrument for discussing all this. Um, this language is used in the same way in connection with any subject matter, even as we have seen those where truth has proved especially elusive and contested, such as ethics and aesthetics, right? So that, I think that gives you an idea about, you know, his general approach in the book. And if we we're going to have an overall summary what Blackburn is doing is looking at a selected number of sort of standard approaches to truth and trying to look at their pros and cons, their strengths and weaknesses, and then shifting to looking at the issue of truth um, and, you know, the many other connected things, justification, how we argue with each other in a variety of, of uh, messier, stickier um, domains of existence. So that's, that's probably going to give you a good idea about what the book is about and what the book is like. We should talk now about some of the main points and key ideas that are being put forth in the work. And we'll also hit on Blackburn's motivations and approach in this. And I think a, a good place to start is the introduction, which begins very interestingly situating this book within a historical and cultural situation. So he says, this is the very first sentence, in 2016, the blithe mendacity and sheer carelessness with facts indulged by politicians in British and America gave rise to the idea we somehow live in a post-truth environment. This was canonized when Oxford dictionaries chose it <coughs> as the word of the year, defining it as an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And he brings up Donald Trump and, and uh, his counselor Kellyanne Conway and then goes back to talking about Machiavelli's The Prince and uh, talks about you know various uh, prime ministers, George Orwell's horrendous vision of a totalitarian, totalitarian control of the truth in 1984. It goes on, you know, quite a bit, but you get the idea. We live in a time when people are not taking truth as, as seriously as they ought to be. And so, you know, it could be good for us to get some sense of what truth is. And if we go to the very end of that, he says, um, thinking we're post anything implies nostalgia for a past that might itself be mythological, a little bit further down, he says, um, there have been philosophers who claim to be skeptical about the very concept of truth. Often it turns out they're really skeptical, either about our own prospects of getting at it in some domain or another, or worried about the status of the powers that lead us to offer one interpretation or another of things. And then he, he goes down, and this is the last paragraph, the basic reason why the concept of truth will never die is that to believe anything at all is to take a stand on its truth. And we cannot do without belief since planning and acting in the world requires it. These are the defenses I develop in this little essay showing why even in highly contested areas, the concept of truth is a survival. So, I mean, that's a great line right there, essay, right? This is not a comprehensive overview of theories of truth. This is a weaving through them to try to get to some sort of point. Um, in the very beginning of part one, he also tells us something that I think is pretty, pretty accurate. There is an air of divinity that hangs over the concept of truth. 
Truth is the goal of inquiry, the aim of experiment, the standard signaling the difference between it being right to believe something and wrong to do so. And, and you know, he goes on. So truth is clearly something that even those of us who say, oh, we're post-truth or, you know, truth is, is tied in with uh, precious power structure. Everyone has some sort of connection to truth. And, you know, like somebody who Blackburn doesn't actually bring up, Epictetus says, everybody wants to actually be in contact with the truth. Nobody wants to be deceived or lied to, uh, you know. And so there's, there's something, there's a sticking power to truth. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, how are we going to make sense of this? And this is where the chapters come in with these classic approaches. So if you've ever taken an intro to philosophy class or looked at, you know, sort of a... Um, typical overview video about truth. You'll hear these three common theories being talked about. Correspondence, coherence, pragmatist, and then you might get a mix of a few other things. Blackburn is going to talk about the deflationist conception of truth and a semantic conception of truth, adding those to the mix. And, you know, correspondence theory of truth is basically, you know, that Truth is, and there's a lot of different formulations, uh, when our, our thoughts or our language correspond to facts or the reality or how things are out there. And there's some problems with that, of course. What about things that are referential, like this statement is a true statement? You know, it's not corresponding to something out in the world. It's language relating to itself or thought relating to itself. And we could go on and on. And so there's a, a discussion in here, you know, about the correspondence theory of truth. And then, you know, a lot of um, crit criticisms, worries about whether this could be an adequate conception of truth. And, you know, it's not a very long um, overview. It's really just 10 pages. Um, but it, it at least gives you some idea about what's going on there. Uh, you know, then we move to the coherence theory of truth, which is usually the next place we go in an intro class or talking about these topics. And a coherence theory of truth says that truth is not in the correspondence between these things, but rather in the beliefs or statements or however we want to frame it, being logically coherent with each other, something that doesn't fit in with our, however you want to call it, web of belief, background, notions, uh, the, you know, the absolute and all of its, its uh, fra uh, frameworks, but all, all of its manifestations, whatever doesn't fit in with that is false, and we figure things out by comparing them to each other in that way. And Blackburn points out that, you know, this works for some things, just as the, co you know, correspondence theory works for some things. And he says something really quite interesting here. Though coherence theory of truth gained a strong following in the 19th century, partly due to the influence of Kant and Hegel, and especially in the thought of British in, uh, philosophers influenced by them known as British idealists, one of its implications is beliefs do not belong to whole systems in the way that pebbles lie on the beach, disconnected from each other and independent of their neighbors. Rather, they belong organically to whole systems or theories of the world in the way that a hand belongs to an arm or an arm to a body. The interlocking system has the character of a living body, an organic whole in which each part gains its value precisely by being a part of the whole. And he says, this idea called the holism of belief systems diverts attention from the single sentence expressing a single truth to whole theories or systems of beliefs. And that's, that's quite true. And then he points out, I think this is actually quite, quite correct, in 19th century hands, the coherence theory had a semi-religious flavor. Ideal coherence, it was thought, could belong only to the thoughts of an infinite mind, a mind capable of encompassing an infinity of interlocking beliefs, somewhat like God's mind, which the idealists christened the absolute. And, and so, you know, he talks about that, and then he points out some of the problems with the coherence theory of truth as well. You know, he says, coherentists have often faltered when trying to explain the importance of control by observation, over-impressed by the omnipresence of interpretation, they have jumped to the conclusion that nothing can count as a reason for holding a belief except another belief, and this is, this is problematic. And this is actually, you know, uh, uh, a decent uh, treatment. Then he has a chapter on pragmatism, and, 
And notice that uh, each of these is not framed as the co you know the correspondence theory of truth, the pragmatic theory of truth. It's just pragmatism. And what's really quite interesting about this is he tells us that, and I think a lot of other people kind of suspect this as well, maybe the pragmatist theory of truth is not something totally separate from these other two. It's really kind of a coherence theory of truth, but taken to another level, you could say. So um, he, he says it this way. American pragmatism is not a rival to coherentism, but an elaboration of it, adding the dimension of success in action and inquiry. So it's sort of like a, uh, you know, co a coherence theory of truth with some extra parts and stuff like that. And there's, you know, a good discussion in here about um, the limits of a pragmatic theory of truth, ultimately getting to talking about um, Richard Rorty and a lot of stuff here from James. He does mention a little bit of, so it's not totally American pragmatism, that mentions a little bit of Nietzsche, but doesn't go into it too much. And then we get to stuff that goes beyond the usual textbook treatments. We have deflationism, which, again, is the, the theory or approach or perspective that Blackburn says he, he has a lot of sympathy with. And deflationism, like he says, starts with an observation that it makes no difference whether we simply assert something or assert it prefacing the assertion with it is true that. So he talks about this transparency property, meaning that like you see through it. Um, saying that something is true is not really saying anything about the statement that's other than like, I, I like this, this, this makes sense to me and stuff like that. So he says deflationism is the view about truth that celebrates its transparency. The core is the idea that once you understand the transparency property, you understand all you need about what truth is. Truth is kind of a dress version of the grunt of assent. There are some bells and whistles to add to this core. If the notion of truth never added anything to what is given by making assertion, it would be entirely redundant. Uh, and so he says, you know, well, what what is the add-on? And, and he goes into, you know, a few things about that. But the deflationist um, viewpoint or perspective is, you, know, you could say, a, a unmasking or, um, you know, taking away the, the, the importance that we've been assigning to the truth in the past. And he also, you know, looks at um, whether there's any, problems with it. He says, um, you know, it seems like it could be refuted, but actually it's not that easy to do that. Um, you know, and he uses the, the success of science as, as an example. And he says, um, you know, we have to be careful with all of these things just to focus on how we do, how we use these, these uh, ideas and expressions in ordinary life. And, uh, you know, this is actually quite a extensive section. So, you, you know, you can tell where, um, where uh, Blackburn is, is placing the emphasis. So this is 15 pages compared to the others. And then we get this short chapter on Tarski and the semantic theory of truth. The semantic theory of truth is basically trying to carry out something like the logicist project did and to give, you know, formally correct definition of the true sentences of a language. He's talking about Tarski here in particular. And, you know, this is quite interesting to read. I don't think the ordinary person is going to get that much out of this compared to the previous ones. And it's essentially an attempt to try to take natural language and determine what would actually count as truth from a purely logical, formal logic perspective. It's the sort of thing that not only Tarski was doing, but also Copy in some of his books, besides the textbooks that he had. So that's that's the first part of this. Then we get to the second part, Varieties of Inquiry. And this is quite interesting, because he begins with aesthetics, truths of taste, truth in art. And he does point out that, you know, we, we don't say that it, it truly is anything goes, anybody can interpret anything anyway. <clears throat> we say that there are practices of criticism, 
And so then the question is, well, are the critics in touch with truth in a way that we ourselves aren't? And, it, you know, he kind of shows his hand here. There's going to be a lot of David Hume being brought up in this second section. And this is uh, the very start of it. If you've ever, you know, read uh, some of Hume's essays, you'll recognize, um, you know, where this is this stuff is coming from. Um, and then he finishes up by talking about Collingwood's, uh, you know, the great British uh, philosopher Collingwood's What is Art? And, um, you know, trying to not reduce our aesthetic response to mere emotion, but say that there can be something there that actually counts as truth. In the truth and ethics section, we're going to see a lot of Hume, a lot of more, a little bit of purse being discussed, and then, you know, the contrast is going to be um, to Adam Smith, who, you know, is a contemporary of Hume, and in some respects is adding something to the picture. And, um, you know, He's starting with more in kind of a, an interesting way, uh, kind of an eccentric way as well, because Moore was famously trying to dissociate ethics from anything that has a naturalistic basis, um, including a lot of other things. And then Hume is brought <clears throat> back in to allow us to do that. There's a lot of attention being paid there to um, uh, Hume's ethical theory, which is worth knowing but is, is a, a kind of strange place to go. Um, and then we get Adam Smith. Um, you know, here's a great example here. Um, Adam Smith departed from Hume. Smith thought that anger and resentment were natural reactions to causes by trespass from another. Um, you know, Smith's rejection of the way in which Hume's conception of justice was wedded to antecedent conventions was taken up and expanded by Kant, who saw respect for each other is a more important foundation stone than the straightforward pursuit of goods and avoidance of evil or satisfactions resulting from this. So that's, you know, that's, that's what's going on in that chapter. Then we have a chapter that's just simply titled Reason, which really has to do much more with action theory and isn't about reason as such. It's about reasonings and it's about giving reasons for and whether these can be said to be true or false, and what, what it would take for that. There's a little bit of a, a detour into talking about philosophy of science, and then we come right back to uh, philosophy of action. You know, here's a great example. We can discuss which movements of the mind are reasonable or unreasonable in this much the same way as we can discuss which motivations and behaviors are admirable or compulsory or impermissible. You know, and he says he points out to you that much of our reasoning is automatic and implicit. Um, you know, but we can we can look at that. And this is a very short section. Then we have a section on religion and truth. And here, you know, the main people that he's actually talking about. He begins with talking about Durkheim, and then it's Hobbes, more Hume, of course. Um, you know, considering stuff from his dialogues concerning natural religion, there's actually a good bit of, like, summarizing what's going on there. And, you know, that's about it, except for this. He says, might religions be accorded the same generosity we earlier gave to aesthetics and ethics? There we turn from bothering about the concept of truth in the abstract to describing and generally speaking, encouraging the practices of the inquirer and the critic. And so he goes and he says, couldn't we just say that there's religious practices, including those of inquiry and discussion that can be regarded both as attempts to know how to improve our awareness and attitudes towards the universe and try and try and as trying to find religious truth. And he goes on and he says, eh, it's not a bad suggestion. There may be some religious practices and attitudes to which it is uh, well fitted um, but yeah, religions are also a way of turning up the volume, he says. A dissenter is not a voice to be accommodated, a fellow inquirer in a serious attempt to allay doubt with whom we may come to be one-minded about things, but someone to be shunned or extirpated. Anathema sit, let it be damned. So looking at the way in which religions implement themselves, it would be naive to be too optimistic, right? And then he says, by the way, this also applies to politics. Uh, 
as well. And then we have a, a final discussion of interpretations, which is, he does mention history, but it's really about law. And it's about how we can, I mean, he talks about interpretive disciplines, but it's really mostly about um, argument about what the law says or what the law is and whether truth and falsity are to be found there in in these interpretations and then we're then we're done that's the entire book uh you know again very short text so what's good about this little book um you know what does get discussed uh because there's a lot of things that aren't getting discussed often is you know, quite decent as i mentioned Blackburn is a good writer and, you know, good thinker, and it's good. It's fun to go along on the ride with him. I do like the fact that he presents uh, theories or perspectives on truth, both, you know, as what truth is and also how it would be applied in things, and then goes on to <clears throat> critique them. That's kind of nice. Um, it could be, as I said, a good springboard for study of, of matters of truth. Um, if you know, sort of the proverbial ladder that you climb up and then, then throw away. I think that's perfectly fine. And I will say that I, I you know, I did like the second half uh, quite a bit better than the first half. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I, I kind of like this this idea. He brings this up in um, the section Truths of Taste, Truth of Art. Um, the application of our discussions in part one enables us to understand the point of Peirce's advice <clears throat> not to start with vagabond ideas that have no human habitation, but with men in their conversation. Um, if we thought of aesthetic truth as some kind of abstraction, uh, uh, you know, a bloodless property distributed who knows how among the things in our universe, it would be hard to see the point of coming to discriminate. So I, I like this this idea that we, we, we do need to remain closer to our lived reality, our interpersonal reality. Um, and, and you could call this a usefulness of not focusing in solely on truth in the abstract, but always looking at, at particularity. And I will say this, um, most of the people that he mentions, um, Blackburn is on point and getting things right in, in talking about them. So I, I think that, you know, that's that's a good feature of the book as well. You know, you, in a book on truth, you definitely want truthfulness. And I will say that there's, you know, there's a good bit of it here in this book. I did find an awful lot in this work that to me seems problematic and... In some cases, I would say even perhaps irresponsible as an author. Now, you could try to deflect these by saying, well, again, he's not trying to provide you with an overview of truth as such or engage every single author throughout history. He's just writing an essay in our post-truth times that's supposed to help out. I don't really buy that line of reasoning. and. He, I think it'll become clear as I talk about some of the things that I thought were problematic. I mean, there are some cases where he's just getting things wrong in a way that strikes me as kind of irresponsible for a philosopher. So here's one prime example. Um, some classical moralists, notably the Stoics, sometimes make it seem as though having desires and aversions at all is a regrettable feature of the human condition and one that we should try as hard as possible to suppress. And then he talks about Kant as uh, showing a degree of sympathy with his harsh view. And you know, he goes on a little bit more and he says, neither Hume nor Smith had much sympathy with his stoic ambition in general. And when he says that, you're like, yeah, you know, this is, he hasn't read the Stoics. He's, he's basically taking this from later authors who got the Stoics wrong. I mean, all you got to do is read Epictetus's Enchiridion chapter one to realize that aversion and desire are the things that are under control and, and we should try to withdraw them from externals, but that doesn't mean that we like suppress them or don't apply them to ourselves. And so that's just a 
you know, a bad read. And, you know, some editor should have caught that or Blackburn should have, should have known better. And so that should, like, put you on guard a little bit. I will say, you know, the other authors who he brings up, he's generally getting right, but, you know, there, there's some problems there. Another really big problem with this book, it it's very parochial in a way. It ignores much of the vast literature out there from ancient times onward, forward, about truth. So, I mean, how do you write a book on truth? And, I mean, he does mention Aristotle, but he doesn't mention the thing that would be most germane, Nick and McCain Ethics book, Six, right? Uh, I mean, there's other stuff in, in Aristotle that would be important, but Aristotle makes a distinction between theoretical and practical truth and elaborates it, and it's right there. And, and Blackburn seems completely, um, it's like something totally unknown to him. He does bring up some other Aristotle stuff, <clears throat> but misses the opportunity. He, he mentioned Nietzsche. Doesn't tell you anything about what Nietzsche's ideas about truth were. And Nietzsche's an important author in this conversation. I don't know how you bring up theories of truth <clears throat> and try to be, you know, comprehensive and ignore, say, Heidegger and the concept of truth is aletheia. Massively important, you know. I don't know how you talk about applications of truth and ignore a lot of the discussions in, you know, the whole of 20th century philosophy of the relations between truth and power, especially if you're going to talk in a post-truth world. Um, there's other authors who he misses along the way. I mean, the correspondence theory of truth should have had a discussion of Aquinas at the very least, or of Anselm, who Aquinas' theory of truth is dependent upon, who's got a whole book called On Truth, in which he lays out truth in, you know, the mind, in expression, also in, going back to the practical stuff, right, the will, action, the being of things. Even if he was just going to reject it, Blackburn should have brought those up. And I, I think it's because he doesn't know these these uh, authors, uh, you know, or doesn't know them well. Um, you know, we could bring up Sextus Empiricus and his many very interesting discussions. We go on and on and on and on about ideas of truth that somehow weren't good enough or didn't make it in, into this. And, and they are actually good enough, and they should have had some mention, at least. Instead, what gets mentioned is the authors that Blackburn clearly is engaged with, um, and, you know, really nobody else. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, Blackburn says that <clears throat> he has <clears throat> some sympathy with the deflationist view, and I kind of think that the deflationist view is similar to what we call emotivism in ethics, which reduces, um, you know, whatever would be true in ethical statements just to emotive matters, you know, or to trying to coerce somebody else. Um, I, I mean, I understand this could be contestable. Somebody's going to point out, that's not what the deflationists are saying. But there's, there's an analogy there that I think um, is, is well worth picking out. I also myself... Um, see kind of an analogy between the people who follow Kant and saying existence or reality is not a predicate and what the deflationist uh, uh, view on truth is doing as well. Um, I think that, and here's my last criticism, I think that Blackburn, so one of the strengths of his work is also a weakness. He's right in that we should avoid like abstract theorizing for its own sake, uh, and we should be focusing on language, on practices, on the cares and concerns of human being and how truth figures into that. The trouble is, is that Blackburn has picked a very narrow and rather parochial group of humans to do that with. Um, not just academic philosophers, but you could say people of a certain type who take themselves as being like the universal <clears throat> voices of human beings. There's, there's so much that doesn't, there's so many voices, so many concerns, so many uh, ways of looking at things that don't even get brought in, into the, even, not even into discussion about this. It's very much a, 
I want to, I'm not going to say ivory tower because I don't really like that metaphor. There's a little falsity to it, but it is an elite group discussion an elite group that's essentially, you know, upper middle class to middle class affiliated with universities, reading the right kind of things, you know, uh, living in the right areas, having the right discussions and leaving everybody else out of the picture, I would say. You know, and, and this doesn't just apply to, like, say, thinking about race or class or gender in the present. I mean, all the people of the past, you know, the Western tradition that he has just ignored as important voices or reduced to a soundbite, I'd say that they are left out of the conversation as well, and all of us in the present who read them and think about them. So it's an unsatisfying book in, in many respects. Um, those are my my criticisms. Those are the things I thought were problematic about the book. So my final thoughts on Simon Blackburn's On Truth. Um, you know, it's not bad. It's not particularly good. It's kind of in between. Um, if you like easy breezy, but still, you know, on point writing, it's got a good style. Um, as I said before, it could be a decent springboard for starting looking into this. And you know, it's nice that he gives you some other places to go, but they're all kind of the same stuff as what what he's doing. So, you know, it's um, I'm giving it a qualified endorsement. It's the kind of book that I would say maybe don't buy as such, but get from your local library. I mean, it is very inexpensive as a book, and if you like having this sort of thing, there's no reason not to buy it. But it's the sort of thing that's a quick read, you know, and you can get it probably anywhere in a local library, or you can sit around in a bookstore and read your way through it as well. And um, that's, that's my recommendation.